hi everyone thanks for joining um we're just a few minutes after one o'clock so i'm sure there'll be a few uh more people joining the zoom but i did want to respect everyone's time and get started um you all know me from the meeting invitations i'm emily rogan the senior program officer at united policyholders um and i'm going to um start the meeting um because Amy Bach is um, doing um, a wonderful job representing all of us, um, but on the advocacy front. So she is currently flying um, from Phoenix, Arizona, where she um, was at the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. So it's the conference with regulators from all 50 states. And she was giving a presentation there on guiding consumers through current home insurance affordability and availability challenges. So exactly um, what we want her to be doing, um, you know, getting out there and, and uh, bringing our concerns, our challenges, and our ideas um, to regulators, um, you know, as we all um, we're feeling the pain here in California, and we know that uh, there are other states as well um, where consumers are in a similar situation um, so we're glad that she's doing that. And she's flying from Phoenix to Washington, D.C., where she's also on the Federal Advisory Committee on Insurance. Um, and they re um, report directly to the um, Federal Insurance Office. So um, with that, um, I'm going to call on my wonderful colleague, Joel Laucher, um, to uh, lead the rest of the meeting. Um, it is being recorded, and I just wanted to say a big thank you to everyone um, for continuing to show up at these meetings um, and give us your feedback. You know, we're all um, in this together, and we're making it um, this wonderful working group that, you know, next month will be our 40th meeting. So I'm really um, glad that this energy is still uh, moving forward and that we're, we're working on this issue together. So thank you, and Joel, um, the meeting. Thank you, Emily. Um, and hello, everybody. Uh, hello, rappers, I guess I should say. Uh, again, thank you for attending. Um, I have a privilege today to uh, introduce our guest speaker, who I, I see is uh, there in the audience at the moment. And that is David Shu. Um, uh, just a little background on David. Uh, after working as an architect and an emergency medical technician, Dave began a brief 32-year uh, career with CAL FIRE, uh, beginning as a firefighter and ending as staff chief for the uh, Division of Planning and Risk Analysis in the Office of the State Fire Marshal. So after retiring uh, for a short time, Last year, he was appointed as Napa County's first ad fire administrator. So he's going to tell us uh, a little bit about his responsibilities in that role. And I'll just add this uh, anecdote uh, about Dave. Um, if you happen to be staffing uh, a uh, community event for a nonprofit, let's say, you're, you, you're at a table and, and Dave's talking to you when that event ends, he will help you pack up your table and carry your stuff to the car. Take it away. All right, everybody, good afternoon. And thank you so much for the invitation to come on board. And I know uh, a lot of, I kind of glanced through, I know a lot of names on the on the uh, visitation. I uh, don't know everybody by a long shot, but uh, welcome to the presentation. And uh, just go through a quick introduction. Uh, Amy reached out to me. Um, I am in a new position. I've been working with Amy uh, for a number of years uh, with NFPA uh, and things like that. And um, I have recently, I guess a, a few months ago now, uh, taken a new position on as the fire administrator for Napa County. And she asked if I might be able to come on and spend a few minutes uh, speaking with all of you about my new position and what uh, what it is and uh, what the vision of it is, and, and just have some general conversation about it. So uh, with that, let's just go to the next slide real quickly. Just a little bit of background about myself. Um, I am, uh, you know, a retired CAL FIRE uh, chief after uh, I worked for 32 years with CAL FIRE. I retired in 2018. Is that the second slide, or is there one prior to that? Well, I think it is. Uh, this, this is the second slide. You're right. 
Um, before I get into my introduction, let's just go through what I hope to talk to today. I will do a, a quick introduction to myself and talk about uh, the general questions, why this position was even created uh, here in Napa County to begin with, uh, give some fire information that kind of justifies the decision by the county to uh, put this position into place, uh, and look at the coordination efforts, what the vision is for it, uh, and just talk about some general comments and hopefully answer any questions you may have. So let's move on to the second, uh, the next slide. So many of you who may know this uh, are, uh, you know, you can take a break through this slide, but um, yeah, I retired in 2018 after 32 years of service with Cal Fire. Uh, I worked at the state fire marshal's office at that time uh, as a staff chief overseeing the uh, office of planning and risk analysis in the state which led me to basically oversee all the fire prevention efforts that the state was uh, in, you know, dealing with, like defensible space in inspections, land use planning, uh, GIS mapping for uh, prevention efforts. Uh, if any of you fondly remember the old SRA fire prevention fee, that was the program I initially was asked to go to Sacramento and run. Um, and so don't hold that against me, but it funded a lot of positions and a lot of work in the fire prevention world that is being accomplished today. So uh, anyway, that was the job I was doing. I, I only half jokingly uh, admit that in 2017 and 18, uh, seeing all the vast amounts of destruction and from fires and things like that, that clearly my uh, function as the chief overseeing all fire prevention in the state, I was obviously failing miserably at my job and I felt that I probably ought to move on to something else. But I ended up uh, taking on a, a consulting job. I formed a company called Wildfire Defense Works that I was doing consulting to insurance companies and uh, basically uh, working with communities to deal with fire prevention efforts uh, and things like that. And then this local job came up and the county reached out and uh, asked if I might be interested in it. And I really thought that after all the consulting work and my years with CAL FIRE and looking at this from a global situation, uh, because we all know this is a global problem, and my involvement with the International Association of Wildland Fire and the California State Fire uh, Safe Council and things like that, I really had an opportunity with Napa County to take all the aspects of fire prevention and the ideas, the research, the science, the theories that was, uh, were all being discussed at all these meetings and really kind of collapse all of that into an actionable plan here in Napa County and put all of it into place and really see what kind of a plan we could create here in Napa County uh, you know, to do that. So uh, I was able to accept the job uh, through the interview process and uh, my first day on the job was October 30th of last fall. So literally, it's just been over about four months that I've uh, been in this position, five months now uh, almost. And so we are still, uh, I have one uh, assistant, uh, a project manager who is helping me uh, in this particular job. And the two of us comprise the entire fire administration for Napa County. So really, that is... You know, that's the nutshell of what I'm doing today. Uh, so let's go on to the next slide and really talk about, you know, why this position, uh, you know, and, and the fact is uh, there is, you know, as probably most of you know, Napa County has been hit very, very hard over the last numbers of years, especially since 2015 and 16 and 17. Uh, 17 specifically with the large fires in the North Bay area, uh, the Tubbs fire that everybody associates with the destruction in Santa Rosa and Coffee Park, of, uh, of course. It actually started on Tubbs Lane, uh, just north of Calistoga here in Napa County. Uh, that's also where a number of the other fires started that came to be comprised as the Nuns Fire, the Atlas Fire, and so on and so forth. And then we fast forward to 2020, and we had the large uh, lightning siege here, the LNU complex that burned well over 350,000 acres just uh, in that one fire. Uh, and then the glass fire that came up, uh, they again started in Napa County, burned up across the ridge over into Sonoma County again. I guess my apologies to Sonoma County for sending them all these fires. Uh, but um, 
The destruction has been tremendous, as you all know. And so what happened in the aftermath of those fires is, of course, a lot of people jumped up and wanted to try to help solve the problem and really started doing some amazing work. I really have to give credit to a lot of people who were in place at that time, the Napa Community Firewise Foundation and a number of other groups and individual property owners in some of the winery associations, the Napa Valley grape growers and Napa Valley vintners and a number of other groups who really started spearheading doing a lot of work. And a lot of that work has been very successful and continues today. But the, the very fact of it is, is that there was a lot of it being done uh, rather independently. A lot of people, you know, through the trauma of those fires, wanted to just take matters into their own hands and try to do some, uh, you know, something about it. And like I said, there's been a lot of good work about it, but the county began to recognize in a coordination with these other groups in the county that there really needed to be some sort of centralized coordination of how all this work was being done, how it was being funded, uh, how it was being coordinated. And so that is where the idea of coming up with a fire administration position took hold. And so the idea behind this is to basically work in tangent with the county um, contract with CAL FIRE as the coordinator for the Napa County Fire Department and really work in tandem with the operational side of things and the Napa Community Firewise Foundation, who was largely the group spearheading a lot of uh, vegetation treatment programs and future visioning of fire prevention planning uh, here in the county. They initiated uh, what is today uh, a very robust CWPP that is online and very interactive. Uh, we're about to look into, you know, updating that and creating uh, some new versions of the CWPP. But really, the supervisors over time started, you know, the County Board of Supervisors really started, you know, having a bit of a conundrum. It was that if they had questions about any particular project or any particular area, it was almost difficult for them to figure out who do I call about it and how do I find out about this? And it was a bit of a scattered approach, albeit a very good approach on many levels, but they really thought that there needed to be some better coordinated work. So that was why the idea of having one point of contact uh, to establish what the vision of a more fire resilient Napa Vec County would look like was very important. Uh, bringing all the projects into place, finding out where we were, looking for a long-term vision and a long-term plan about how we move into that more resilient future uh, for Napa County and, and literally having a single point of contact uh, for them. So the position is actually at the executive level. Uh, I report directly to the county CEO here in the county and work directly with the county board of supervisors individually. And uh, so that is the position as a department head in the county. Essentially, I am responsible for all the fire activities that go on here in the county. And I work very closely with uh, Cal Fire and the Napa members of Napa County Fire Department on budgets and um, personnel issues and the chipper program and the large uh, brick program that we have coming. Many of you may know about the BRIC program that exists already in Sonoma County. And Napa County is on the verge. In fact, we're uh, this week answering some questions that came in just to clarify a few things. But we expect to be given the green light to move forward with our BRIC grant, which will bring about $50 million in funding, uh, both from the federal government and uh, a matching uh, some matching funds from here in the county. And that's going to provide a real solid foundation for us to start putting a lot of actionable items in place. And I'm very excited about being able to be a part of building that action. One of the ideas that I want to bring forward is uh, I'm going to highlight a program that many of you may or may not know about. But a few years ago, the National Fire Protection Association, NFPA, 
put together the Outthink Wildfire campaign, which really highlights five tiers, and I apologize, I don't have them all in front of me, but it involves five components of a 30-year plan to look at reducing or even eliminating uh, the uh, destruction of our communities uh, from wildfires. And you ask, how do you establish a 30-year plan? And the 30-year plan... Oh. Volunteers, second day are meaningful. Oh, I'm sorry. Was there a question? I think somebody, everybody needs to make sure they're on mute. Oh, I said, oh I'm sorry. I thought somebody was asking a, a question. Days. I apologize. No. Um, so uh, I think I saw a thing come up in the chat about the BRIC grant. I can stand, you know, the BRIC grant is a FEMA grant that is, stands for Building Resilient Infrastructure for Communities. So that is the, the definition of a BRIC grant. Uh, and so that is going to be funding a lot of our fire prevention work, both in home hardening as well as defensible space options and things like that. So uh, essentially going back to looking at uh, how we are going to be doing that is really going to be a lot, uh, a lot of my job. Uh, you know, we are uh, working on a, a very robust chipper program that we have here in the county and coordinating the efforts of the Napa Community Firewise Foundation uh, and all of those kind of things. So that is a lot of what we're uh, going to be doing. And my job is to essentially act as a coordinator for all of that, uh, to be able to uh, act as the point of contact, uh, coordinating all the other departments, such as public works and the building and planning and emergency services, uh, environmental services, and, and really establishing a long-term view. Uh, I, I was going back to the five points that the National Fire Protection Association has for the Outthink Wildfire campaign. And what it does is it really looks at the reality that making these sorts of large scale paradigm shifts of getting people more on board with fire prevention efforts is a generational effort. Uh, as we all know, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with the reality that there's a lot of people who are very skeptical or resistant to looking at accepting the non-combustible zone around your structures uh, that so many of us talk about today uh, and are trying to implement in our uh, local regulations and codes and things like that. But that's a very, very difficult thing. And I'm sure many of you have heard the same comments I have is that people look at it and it doesn't fit the paradigm of what they think of as attractive landscaping around their homes. And it's a very, very difficult notion for people to really wrap their brains around how do they accept a new idea of landscaping their homes, of providing defensible space, especially in neighborhoods where the distance between structures uh, is very short. And so how what does that look like between neighbors uh, and things like this? So those are all the struggles that we're really trying to establish. And quite frankly, as we all know too, all of these notions go far beyond where the existing local codes are. So state regulations and the chapter 7A that we have here in California uh, and so forth uh, often don't even reach the level of the research and science that say the uh, Insurance Institute of Business and Home Safety, IBHS, that many of you are familiar with, with their Ember testing and uh, the wildfire prepared home program that they have, as well as the um, wildfire prepared home plus program. So many of those programs that are out there are still not yet embedded in uh, enforceable codes in many jurisdictions. And the challenge is how do you implement those codes uh, to increase uh, the safety and, and, and reduce that risk of structures from igniting to begin with? And that's exactly what we want to do. We want to find ways to reduce the likelihood of structures from ever impacting uh, or ever igniting in a wildfire to begin with. So that's that is the whole vision of what we're trying to do here. 
And so my job as the fire administrator uh, is to sort of put that plan together and work with all the departments, the fire department here in the county, uh, the uh, all the other agencies and, and work with legal, uh, our legal counsel and everything else on ways that we can be more successful in implementing that. So just like most other plans that look at a very long-term process, I'm also looking at this as a long-term plan to adapt into the county structure so that in the long run, we can actually get people to think more proactively about being a part of a community that is embedded in a wildfire prone environment, but has managed their landscapes, their properties, their neighborhoods and communities in a way that has established a vegetation wellness around those communities and hardened their structures so that when the next fires and the future fires continue to impact these neighborhoods, the fires can do their thing and roll through the landscape, but largely we have our homes, our businesses, and our communities to go back to. Uh, if you wanna to go to the next slide uh, very quickly, um, I've talked about some of these things. Uh, you know, Amy asked me if uh, I could comment on what my thoughts are on the zero to five foot zone. Uh, there's two phases of concepts that I think um, how to go ahead and, uh, you know, coordinate that idea of the zero to five foot zone. First of all, I think it is um, very, very clear that that strict zero to five foot non-combustible zone around homes can have a great deal of influence in reducing the likelihood of ignitions on structures today. I think that we've proven that in the laboratory. We have actually seen it on the, on the ground, in place, in fires in the recent past. And so we know that that action itself, if nothing else, can go a long way towards helping to reduce the ignition of structures in a wildfire environment because it's all about the embers. If the embers have nothing to ignite when they're swirling around those non-combustible zones at the base of a house, then your house is less likely to ignite to begin with. So I think that that is very, uh, there's very solid research and evidence behind that. The challenge in our society today is that there's a lot of resistance to being able to implement that zero to five foot zone, as I'm sure we've all encountered. And so how do you bridge the gap between what the science and research tells us and what the appetite from the public is to accept some moderation of that. I believe that that is the struggle that the Board of Forestry and Fire Protection in Sacramento is going through in how to actually finalize written language in the Public Resources Code to find somewhat of a compromise. The understanding from the state is that many people are resistive to absolutely nothing combustible within that five foot zone. So is there a way to allow some small amount of vegetation that is uh, very resistant to ignition and doesn't support combustion or the flame spread to the homes in some circumstances, specifically along walls that may have no windows above them or next to doors and things like that. So I believe that there are some ways that we can incorporate some minimal landscaping that would allow people to have some kind of greenery or some kind of vegetation that would still be uh, very resistive to ignition uh, potential of the structure, but allow some people to have something. Now, this is just myself as David Shu talking. Uh, I don't want to have anybody think that this is influencing what the final regulatory language will look like. But I think we've all encountered that there probably is some happy medium uh, between where that all looks and how we will implement that. Uh, where is the future of the CWPP? I see the future of the CWPP as being something that we will really embrace and become a much stronger strategic document that will roll into the future uh, forever. 
I like the um, I like the idea that uh, thinking of it as a wheel that the CWPP becomes a wheel that just continues to roll down the road long into the future and not even putting a sunset on it. This is something that we need to create that will be self-contained and self-continual forever. Uh, because we all know that the wildfire environment isn't going to get any better anytime soon, certainly not in our lifetimes, and that we need to create a, plat a platform and a method to provide and create a more fire-resilient landscape that will continue to, you know, march down the road far into the future. You know, one of my perceptions is that there's too many people who think of a document like a CWPP uh, or some kind of a plan as having some sort of an end date on it. Uh, you know, I've literally had people ask me the question, when are we going to be done with all the work that's identified in the CWPP? Well, the answer to that is never. Uh, the work will never be done. There is going to be a continuing maintenance item uh, in, introduced to that. And the CWPP needs to also be flexible enough to make sure that we are incorporating new science and research as it comes along uh, and also uh, working on it. Um, I just saw somebody, just to clarify, a CWPP stands for a Community Wildfire Protection Plan. So a Community Wildfire Protection Plan uh, or some people say a prevention plan, uh, is actually a document that outlines what that community is doing to look at their fire risk and how they choose to address that and mitigate that as best they can. So uh, I think that those are uh, documents that should be established as ongoing uh, dynamic documents that should march well into the future. Um, when I say conversations on this slide here, I, I mean that I believe that the conversation about wildfire in general uh, needs to be adjusted from talking about the fires that we've experienced and been traumatized by in the past and learn from those experiences and trauma and not let go of it. I, I don't want anybody to think that that trauma is not real. Uh, and that that trauma is not uh, something that people should just get over. Uh, it's something that many people, uh, myself included, you don't get over those kind of things. Uh, they are seared into your memory, quite literally. And I think it's important to recognize that trauma, but using it to change our conversation from what we've gone through and looking at the fires in the past, but talking about it in a different way that allows us to think differently about the future of wildfires and how we'll be more successful moving into the future. And that's one of my goals is to really look at that, of changing that conversation. And that includes really becoming uh, even more engaged and in introducing and incorporating uh, the global research that is being done uh, all over the world on this wildfire problem. Uh, you know, we, we witnessed last summer uh, you know, not only the massive fires in Canada, uh, but the, you know, the destruction of downtown historic Lahaina. And we just a couple of months ago witnessed the uh, incredibly destructive fires in South America and Argentina and Chile, and just a few weeks ago in Texas. So this is a global problem that is happening on greater scales uh, all over the world. And so that research is going to be really important for us to uh, adapt and find ways to incorporate it into our plans to make that more fire resilient uh, community. Uh, and, and really, like I said before, the social engineering of it, getting people to change their conversation, accepting the research and science that is telling us how we can be more successful as we march forward in the future, and really looking at how society accepts fire as being a natural part of the environment and stops looking at it as some sort of an enemy that we have to fight. We want to accept the fact that we are the ones who've chosen to live in a natural fire environment and learn how to be more successful 
when fire does burn through our communities. And so with that, uh, that is really sort of the basis of my entire job here in Napa is to take all of those ideas and put them into place. Uh, and uh, if there are other counties looking at establishing a similar position, uh, I'm more than happy to. If you go to the final slide here, uh, it has my contact information. Uh, I welcome uh, anyone coming up uh, to, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you go to that last slide there. Don't know who's controlling the thing. There we go. So there's my contact information and my email address uh, here in Napa. And uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have questions. And Joel, I think you're moderating. So if there's questions that we can talk to, I see there's been quite a few comments coming up in the chat about vegetation around the homes. I think that zero to five foot zone generated some comments. So uh, I haven't gone through and um, I wasn't monitoring the chat as we went through here, but uh, if you were, Joel, I'm happy to answer questions I can. Yeah, and I think there were some responses. So I'll just ask uh, if you do have a question, of, uh, David, right now, if you could raise your hand and we'll try to catch uh, anybody between Emily and I that we can see that has a hand up with a question. Just do a couple minutes there. I see um, David Zelensky's hand is up. You want to ask your question, David? Yeah, I didn't hear you mention working with fire safe councils. I assume Napa County has fire safe councils. Yeah, absolutely. In Napa County, the Napa Community Firewise Foundation is the umbrella that has coordinated a total of, uh, so far we have 21 active fire safe councils around the county. Uh, we have another eight or nine that we are working with to still become uh, firmly established. So yes, uh, in Napa County, we work very, very closely uh, with all the local fire safe councils around the county. Uh, the Napa Community Firewise Foundation as the nonprofit has been very successful in receiving grants from both the State Fire Safe Council and CAL FIRE. And so a lot of that funding is going forward uh, with helping those fire safe councils achieve their project goals around their community. So yes, there's a very close working relationship with fire safe councils, both at the local and state level. Thank you, David. I was a little bit confused because usually FireWise is a designated community and the fire safe councils, the 51C3, but I guess they use the name of FireWise in their 501C3. That, that is exactly right. Uh, but it, it functions as sort of the parent umbrella uh, over the fire safe councils here in Napa County. I got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, okay. I saw Gretchen stand up. Do you want to go, yes. Gretchen? Hi. Um, first of all, I want to say Napa County is so lucky to have you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question about sort of the green environment. Um, I'm also very involved in a fire safe council here in Napa, so very much in favor of vegetation reduction and all of that. But after having a big glass fire come through, um, we're trying to sort of orient towards how do we do some restoration of the forest and the natural environment and, uh, and also issues of how to um, reduce the vegetation, but still have carbon sequestration and then just um, habitat for animals. So uh, are, is there some part of your thinking and your programs going forward uh, that would incorporate some of those restorations and um, sort of green protections? Uh, absolutely. Uh, the healthy forest initiatives are a big part of the vision of the future. And in fact, uh, having a more green, more lively and healthy forest is also uh, a big contributor to carbon sequestration. Uh, not only are they more robust in sequestering carbon, but they're more robust in resisting uh, bad wildfires when they do come through. They're healthier, they're more resilient. And so all of those things together, we kind of have to look at it all as one big package mm -hmm. that once those all become uh, synced together, that they will all help contribute to less impacts when fires burn through them and, and, and actually will contribute to helping uh, be more valuable with our, uh, you know, saving our communities. So that is all a part of that big plan is 
you know, building that more fire resilient environment that includes uh, greener models for uh, the the ultimate landscape. And yeah, that and I I'm I'm really glad you brought that up because I'd like people to more you know there you're probably well aware of the fact that there's some people that think that the efforts of fire you know prevention and vegetation clearance means that we're getting rid of stuff. Mm-hmm. The reality is it actually helps. It boosts that greenery and and make it more resilient and makes it much much healthier overall. And I hope we can really get that message across. That's a that's a real important component, I think. Thank you. I'm not. Uh, anyone else have a hand up? I'm not seeing one, but I might be missing. If you've raised a hand either electronically or if you have a question. Emily, are you seeing any? Nope. I don't see any raised hands. I see Susan Fromer just. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's just that um, uh, Mr. Shoes, David Shoes, info was put up and then it just disappeared. And so could you post that again, please? (laughs) Yes, I'll put it in the chat right now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, I, I want to thank you, David. I, I think uh, probably every, every county is kind of thinking we probably need to coordinate our efforts as well. Um, I, I think uh, we do have a lot of, you know, people and communities and groups kind of doing their work, and uh, we'd all benefit for, from integrated mitigation and efforts and advancement of the sciences. Um, And um, I mean, there are some things, some simple things I shared last week that I still haven't replaced my wooden gates. But I I do see, sadly, that um, in my suburban neighborhood, new fences go up every week with a wooden gate and connection to the house. And somehow we haven't changed our local codes just just to address this very simple common uh, feature that um, then becomes a hassle to undo. Um, So a lot of things that can be done and some from small to large. So thank you. And it's great to see you, David, as well. So. Yeah, I might make one. I, I'm just kind of flipping through some of the comments. There's a lot of comments here about insurance because this is, uh, you know, UP. So um, I think I would like to make a comment that uh, just this past Saturday, uh, Napa County held their third annual fire resources fair, which brought together a lot of uh, prevention of uh, companies, uh, people who are engaged with fire prevention, fire suppression, uh, you know, tree removal companies, chipper programs, all kinds of things. Uh, goats were there in, you know, in, in a great quantity uh, and things like that. So there's, it was a really good fair that we had a lot of people there and there were insurance providers there too. And insurance was a big topic of conversation. And uh, I even spoke to some people who just as recently as last week were in London uh, talking to Lloyd's of London and things like this. And they Uh, are talking to a lot of people uh, that are beginning to see, I'm beginning to hear a lot of the insurance industry sort of turning the tide of moving away from that broad scale zip code view and really beginning to notice and take uh, uh, pay attention to people who are taking these positive actions and these proactive measures uh, of their properties and their homes and that was really good for me to hear. And, and, and again, this is, this is just coming from people who've been talking to insurers uh, at that reinsurance level uh, in London, even as early as last week. So that was really positive for me to hear that they're, you know, we've been talking to them about these kinds of changes uh, for quite some time. And it really was refreshing for me to hear that they, they are, that dialogue is really taking place. Uh, at those upper levels. So that that has to mean to me that that is going to start filtering down and that, you know, eventually when you get it down to the local, um, you know, broker level and underwriter level uh, for individual insurance companies, that has to me- make a difference. And so, you know, one of my messages I, I would like to parrot that hopefully all of you will parrot out there is that 
people need to start believing that uh, this will, at some point in time in the future, if not already, start to make a real difference and it will have an, uh, an, an impact in decisions by insurance companies as to whether or not they choose to insure you or not. Uh, and so I think, I think that's, that's a real strong message that there are things that we can do about this. There are things that people can do on their property and individual homes. And those choices will determine uh, what some outcomes are. So I think that's, that's an important message uh, to share with people as we go forward. Thank you, David. And actually, I'm going to, for this part of the agenda, I'm going to talk about a little bit right now about what is happening in insurance world, uh, especially uh, residential insurance. Um, so one thing, just to pick up on this particular topic, you may recall that a, a little while back, the Department of Insurance did implement regulations to require that insurers give discounts for a number of mitigation actions. I think they were uh, consistent with the um, state's safer from wildfire set of mitigations. And that included class A roof and uh, ember resistant vents and the five foot um, uh, zone around your home that was uh, free of any uh, combustibles and several other components to the landscaping component of that. So there are already individual mitigation discounts in place for each of those items. And uh, insurers have filed for those discounts. Some of them already had them in place, about a dozen insurers, but uh, many more have since had those approved. Now the tough thing is um, the initial discounts aren't very large because the insurers weren't tracking some of these items. So they don't have data to support how big or small the discount would be. So basically what they file are kind of placeholder discounts like two or three or 4% for some of these things, not a huge discount, but as those discounts prove themselves over time, that homes you know, that have done those things don't burn or have losses, then the discounts will be bigger. And as they prove themselves over time, homes that have done those things will likely become more eligible. But right now, for uh, most insurers, the mitigation, having done all those actions alone will not ensure that you are eligible for coverage. So insurers continue to use wildfire risk models, which can look at your slope and the a degree of brush or forest is near your home. It can look at in the more uh, granular versions of the models, whether tree limbs hang over your house, you know, what other uh, hazards are near your home. So these um, things, you know, insurers are looking, but your rates are kind of the, um, they're a, a combination of a insurer's view of something like 20 at least aspects of your home. For example, the, the protection class, you know, back to the, the rating of your local fire department, your territory. So insurers, still group homes together by zip code. You know, zip codes that have, that are generally, um, you know, one next to the other that have similar loss experience might be grouped together. But generally zip code is a, is a differential. Age of home, you know, there are several things that go into consideration, but so, and make a big difference a, on whether you're eligible, and B, on how much you pay. So um, I was mentioning earlier, we we're talking about the state farm rate filing uh, that was that average 20%, but varied distinctly by zip code as one way it had a differential, but it also de de uh, depended on what kind of protection class you're in, 
um, the age of the home, all of these things still have an impact. So you really can't tell much by looking at, oh, well, State Farm got an overall 20% increase because actually even under that increase, a small percentage of homes actually got a rate decrease in you know, certain territories and certain characteristics, while there were other homes that probably got more than a 100% rate increase. And this is true of how every insurer's rates are today. And even despite those increases, we have a couple things coming up. And that is because many insurers have stopped writing new business and have non-renewed a lot of the homeowners they had for many years. So changes that the insurance commissioner that has proposed that are coming up in the very near future. In fact, uh, Commissioner Lara's already put out a, um, a announcement of a workshop on regulations for uh, wildfire risk models. So currently, um, your rates do not reflect projected losses that a wildfire risk model might generate. Currently, insurers use wildfire risk models to score a home, but not to predict how much in losses will be added into the rates. In other states, insurers use those models. So they don't just add in losses that they've actually uh, experienced, but they use the projected losses that these models say are likely to occur in a given region based on that region's wildfire history over multiple decades and its current landscape. So I think we're going to see if that change to the rates happens and wildfire risk models go into effect in rate making, we're gonna see another round of significant rate increases. Now that theoretically may make insurers more willing to write in areas that they are not writing business in today. So what we're talking about is the commissioner trying to reach a balance of availability and affordability, but sacrificing the affordability component a bit to get to more availability. Even so, there's no guarantee that insurers will write in some of those places. So it is a, um, a big risk that uh, I believe the commissioner is taking. Um, so something you know that to look at as coming up in the very near future. The other reg that the commissioner is looking at implementing is one to allow insurers to pass their reinsurance costs through to consumers. Uh, you know, it's always it's been mentioned before that insurers buy insurance so that they can cap their losses at whatever level they feel comfortable absorbing and, um, and whatever level they don't want to absorb beyond. Uh, so they buy reinsurance. You know, it could be a $100 million limit above $100 million in losses, for example. So it would kick in if there was a major wildfire. Well, currently those costs aren't passed through to consumers. The commissioner is proposing, proposing that those costs be passed on to consumers in the rates. Again, meaning rates will go up, but theoretically, again, meaning insurers will then be more willing to write more broadly in California. So there's some big changes potentially ahead that could meet, make for greater availability and uh, could greatly impact affordability as well. So um, you should keep an eye on the CDI website and um, you might wanna sign up to sh share your thoughts about these things 
at any upcoming hearings. So I, I don't know if anyone has any questions about those items here. You're welcome. If you do, um, you could either raise your hand or put it in the chat. And he's been waiting, Joel. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, go ahead. Uh, who was it? Sandy's been waiting. Oh, wait a second. Am I, oh, I'm open. Um, <clears throat> no, I've just, I've gotten an estimate for a significantly expensive set if I got all new vents as an alternative to the one eighth inch or one sixteenth inch mesh. But I have not really understood deeply how big of an improvement that is for safety from just updating the mesh. But I also here in San Diego have not been able to find, you know, I just haven't been successful so far in finding anyone who will get up on my second story and actually put the mesh in the, in the vents. And I just, I don't, you know, I'd like to know about the increased safety with, with the new quality vents that are for new construction. And if that's worth it, or if not, how do I get somebody that will crawl up on my second story? <laughs> so I didn't know if anybody knew what the, what the practical outcome of this, because I'm willing to do either. I just, I hate to spend $4,000 if I don't have to. Yeah. But I'm not going to climb up on my roof either. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody has a company in San Diego that they know that I could call and they could actually, they knew what they were doing and they would be willing to do it. Because otherwise we're going to be telling all of our community members to go do something that we don't know how to get done either. Any San Diegans with a uh, potential response? <laughs> Joel, there was a comment in the chat from somebody from San Diego earlier that was addressing when Sandy had put it in the chat. Yes. So this is Jason McBroom. I'm I'm the fire marshal here in Alpine for the Alpine Fire Protection District. And I attend the meetings with for the General Fire Safe Council with Sandy. Uh, mm -hmm. And Sandra, I'd be happy to go ahead and email you Brangard. As a matter of fact, um, Kelly Burkamp is, is on the this meeting right now and oh. she can directly get in contact with you. She's the main point of contact for Brangard Bents. Yeah, no, because I that the representative that I've been working with with, with Brangard said they wouldn't do updates, they only would do install new installations. So if there's a difference, I would be glad to find out. Yeah, Brangard is the, the leading manufacturer in right. retrofit of existing vents. Okay. You want to make sure that any retro work that's done is listed and approved. So right. Brangard has the listing for yeah. the retrofit uh, on the building materials list for the state fire marshal's website. Yeah, no, and I'm just saying in talking to Brangard in the last couple of weeks, I was told that they would only do the new California state approved for new construction installation. So I would be glad to have, you know, to hire somebody to do the retrofit if that's an acceptable alternative and it's practical. So okay. I would love to. Yeah. I just, I'll, I'll, to, I, I just didn't know how to get a hold of anybody. Sandy, what I'll do is I'll email you after this meeting directly with uh, Kelly's direct contact okay. information. I don't okay. see the meeting anymore. All right, thank you. Okay. I saw a question about where one finds zip code data. Um, so in at the department, of insurance website, there is a place that you can look up rate filings. Uh, and so uh, I think it's uh, called WARF is the um, page on there where you can most readily look at a filing. So you have to search by insurance company and type of line and rate increase. It's a pretty technical thing to do for the average citizen there, um, because the rate filings themselves are, as I mentioned, thousand page documents often, and uh, include a lot of uh, data to support the rate increase or occasional decrease that an insurer wants, but uh, wants to change its rates by. But um, 
typically most filings do have a page uh, that identifies by zip code the maximum uh, percentage change and a dollar change um, in that zip code. Um, you know, it can tell you something, but you know, again, it's quite a range that can occur even within a zip code, uh, particularly in zip codes where the um, may include an urban piece at the base of a hill and then a residential piece that rises up the hill behind the urban area, which is a very common uh, layout for California cities and uh, um, in the Bay Area and Southern California, right? We typically in the Bay would have a piece of Oakland that right against the Bay and then the Oakland Hills. And they are going to receive very different rate treatment even within a given zip code. So, um, you know, there are a lot of other considerations besides zip code that goes into that rate. And one of those is a wildfire risk score. And so that urban near the Bay home is gonna have a much higher, or excuse me, lower wildfire risk score impacting it than the one up the hillside. Age of home, all these things play a difference, but you can just, you can see your zip codes rate impact um, if you wanna go through all that. And I could probably uh, pluck one out of the State Farm filing and post it uh, somehow. Any other questions before we move to Emily and wrap this up? All right, we'll give um, Jen the last question and then I'll um, wrap it up with some announcements. Go ahead, Jen. Thanks, Emily, and thanks, Joel, for all of your guys' hard work and effort. I'm Jen with Rebuild Paradise Foundation in Paradise, California. And um, I know that, you know, you talked about some people are seeing as much as 100% increase, that our community is 600 to 1,000% increase. And we lost all of our fuel. We are building to strict code. We have strict ordinances. We have the first IBHS certification. And those people are still experiencing these massive increases. And it is incredibly defeated. People have poured their blood, sweat, and tears after they lost everything. And now they're losing their home. Um, this, is, this is very real in our community. And it is devastating. People are falling out of escrow. People have no homeowner's insurance. Um, that is very happening very prevalently in our community and it's almost going to be entirely California fair plan. No one is writing up here anymore. Um, even when we're going to these extreme measures. So it's so hard to try to motivate people to do these, what I consider extreme measures, which we're already doing. And then there is, they're almost getting punished. It seems, um, I know our history is not good, but our future is great. And so just please keep, um, you know, I, it feels like we have no voice in this game and we're being hit the hardest. So please be a voice for our community. Um, this is just more of a statement than a question. And I appreciate all that you're doing. If um, all of you who are on this meeting, I always encourage people to come to Paradise, see what we're doing. Um, we have come very, very far in these five years since our fire. We don't want to give up. We haven't, we're not a community to do that. Um, we're becoming firewise. We're doing whatever we can. Um, and our own foundation is coming up with a new, what we're calling defensible space rock grant that will be for residents to help inspire and create the five foot, the zero to five feet zone. We're working with a local rock yard where people will get a voucher grant to get rocks delivered to their home. So um, thank you guys for what you're doing. That's all. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jen. And that's a really innovative solution. I really um, am glad to hear that. We'll um, continue um, to, you know, to spotlight Butte County and what you guys are going through. Um, I want to um, just remind everybody, you know, who who shared um, their premium increases in the beginning of the meeting and um, and to all of you who serve, you know, larger communities to share our 2024 California Home Survey. 
Um, it's in almost every email I send y'all. Um, and I'll be sure to follow up with it. It's uphelp.org slash CA home survey. Um, a lot of the change that we want to and have to make, um, there needs to be a little data behind it. It's really important for us to collect data um, from, you know, so that we can end to hear the stories of how it actually affects people, right? So, you know, the, it can, we can have like the the you know rough percentages of what the insurance companies are asking for, but then when you hear the stories of how it actually impacts people, you know that's what will that's what will spur, um, you know it it gives us more fuel to be able to you know be the voice for consumer insurance consumers and how does it this actually um, impact people? So um, please um, take the survey yourself. Encourage your neighbors and community members to take the survey, um, and then we will see you back. Um, back here um, next month. And I uh, put the date in the chat, but then I scrolled away. So uh, April 23rd is our next wrap meeting. Um, you'll um, be getting um, an email from me with more information on how to register. And I just wanted to thank um, everybody for coming, everyone for staying on, and um, especially to Joel for um, leading the meeting. So um, thank you all, and we'll see you in April. That's a wrap. <laughs>